Good morning and welcome to worship here at St. Luke's. We're glad that you're joining us from home or from afar, and we hope that you will light a candle and get prepared, get comfortable to explore what God has to say for us, to us today. I want you to think about, do you know those cynical people that are sarcastic or um, come at you with a negative tone? Well, Chuck is going to be bringing us a wonderful message on about thinking the best of people and thinking about our future and all the, the ways that we can set our minds on Jesus and set our minds to the positivity and love of God. So now let us prepare our hearts in going together in worship. Thank you, God, for the gift of education, for our children's desire to learn and grow, for friends who have similar interests, but who challenge them in new ways too. We pray their educators are inspired and energized every day by their calling. We pray this year would be led by you. Each day they would step through the door you open, keep them safely protected, and may you bless them with opportunities to be a light to others as they learn more about you. We ask for wisdom and strength to raise them up in the purpose and plan you have for them and the truth of your word. Amen.
I'm Susan Dickens, a member of the Grief Ministry Team at St. Luke's. The Grief Ministry Team is an arm of the Congregational Care Ministries that you've been hearing about during some of the fruitful moments during Church on Sundays. I felt called to become a member of the Grief Ministry Team because of losses that I've experienced. I lost both my parents within months of each other and a spouse after a very short illness. The loneliness of grief can be overwhelming and, cr and crushing but the love of God and my family and friends were invaluable to me. And that is what we in the grief ministry want to offer to our church family. We want to cover them with comfort, love, and prayers. In the grief ministry, we document every church member who passes away. We keep track of their birth dates, their death dates, anniversaries, and holidays that are special. We also have all of the information for the loved one who will be journeying through grief. Then we keep up with them in the following months through cards, calls, visits, literature that will guide them through the grief process and anything else that may arise, such as dealing with an estate, a will, or finding services that benefit the family. One of the things that we lack are members. If you're interested in working with someone as they walk through their grief journey by giving them your presence and your prayers and sending them cards or calls, please let Pastor Monica, Beth Osbar, or me know, and we'll be happy to pair you up with someone who is needing that support during grief. One of the things that has arisen out of the grief ministry is an event we're very excited about. An act of love, preparing for your future, will occur Sunday, August 22nd from 2 to 4 p.m. in the Family Life Center. Anyone of any age who's an adult needs to be preparing for death. It's awkward and it's uncomfortable to talk about, but it's inevitable. We will have a pre-planning professional who will help you to know what to do to have a plan complete for a funeral and memorial service. A lawyer will be there to discuss wills, trusts, financial planning. We will also have a specialist to talk about end of life care, whether it is medical or whether it's comfort care. The pastoral team and a funeral director will talk about the care the family will receive after your passing. You will receive a wealth of information, not only through the question and answer sessions, but lots of documentation to take home with, your, with you so that you can begin the planning process for yourself. If you're unable to attend the event, our church greeters will have a copy of an Act of Love booklet for you after the service. This booklet will guide you through the entire planning process for end of life. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that God is the greatest comforter of all for people in trials and tribulations. And because we receive that comfort from God, we in turn are then to turn around and offer comfort to others. Thank you for listening to our talk today about the grief ministry. I hope to see some of you at the event, and I certainly hope that some of you will join the ministry team. Many thanks to the Primary Ministry Fund for taking care of all of our services within this church, and especially the grief ministry. This morning, as we go to the Lord in prayer, there is much that has happened in our world, and in our communities, and even in our homes. And so I invite us to think about how we might pray for those in Afghanistan, those people who are stuck and facing an enemy. And I might add, how are you thinking about the people in Haiti who have maybe have lost everything or those in Western North Carolina who have faced the floods as rain has come in? There are so many things around our world, hurt and pain. And so I invite us this morning to reflect on that and pray not only for our own needs, but for the needs of others. Let us go now in prayer. Oh God, we come to you with open hearts, open minds, and open spirits, oh God, to just allow you to pour into us, to be willing and vulnerable before you, oh God, our maker, our creator, and our sustainer. God, you're above all things, and 
and in all things. And Lord, we there's so much that's happened in our world this week. And we don't understand why the floods come and why the tornadoes and hurricanes happen. We don't understand why earthquakes shake the ground. We don't understand why people are hurting and suffering. And so God, we turn to you, our comfort, our guidance for knowledge. We turn to you, oh God, to allow our hearts to come to you. God, in all things, when we don't know the answer, you provide us wisdom, you provide us comfort, and you still direct our paths. You offer grace in the midst of darkness. Your light shines in those hidden places. And so, Lord, we pray this morning throughout all of this that your light may be seen so prevalent in those dark and hidden and hard places right now in our world and in our lives. God, there are so many that are going through things that your heart, I'm sure, breaks for your children. Lord, you tell us that you love us with an everlasting love. And so we know that you love all of those in these situations and those around the world this morning. And so, God, we hold on to that hope that your love is, is everlasting because your word tells us that. And, Lord, we pray that we hang on to that when troubles come and when our eyes meet an article or read a news blurb on our phones that we hang on to that your love is still with us even when we don't see it in those situations. God, help us this morning think the best, not just in our minds, but in our hearts. As we look to other people, as we look to a future, oh God, when we see such destruction and things around us, help us to know, God, and lean on your word that you make all things new, that your path is one of purpose that your path oh god is the right path that will lead us to a life eternal and lord that's hope beyond anything that may happen here that our life is not about what happens in the world even though we experience it our life is about you and our faith follows that as your disciples and so god we thank you for that hope this morning that we can cling to so lord, lord let our minds rest upon that when all else fails you remain the same when all else fails you remain the same yesterday today tomorrow and forever and you are that constant thread that we can come to with all that's on our heart but lord we can come to with our praises and our joys and our accolations of of what we've experienced and how we've seen you at work and and how we've endured love and how lord that the things of this world has has not hindered us but shaped us in a way that we know that you are god and that we are firm your work within us and around us and so God we give you today and we thank you for listening to us that we can bring our troubles and worries but we can bring our frustrations to you and there's no judgment but there's love in that and so God we lift up our hearts to you this morning praising you for not what you do to us today or for us today, but for the simple fact of who you are, our Lord and Savior. Oh, gracious God, 
we lift up these prayers and praise with grace, thanksgiving for your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Nobody tells stories about sunny days when the weather was perfect and the wind was just right. Not good stories, anyway. In the stories we love, the skies grow dark, the waves leap high, a shark circle. We're never quite sure how the hero will survive. So why is it that when the dark days come our way, we worry that the story has gone wrong? Why do we declare that God is good when the sun shines? and then resist Him just when we need Him most. If He's already written our perfect, endless ending, is the writer trustworthy to get the middle right, to surprise us with His love one more time? Faith begins when we can't imagine what the next chapter holds. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be able to worship with you again this Sunday and hope this time of worship will be a blessing and is being a blessing to you as I speak. So, I want to share just one verse. We're covering a large section of the Sermon on the Mount as we continue going deeper into it. Uh, but that one verse is this, a verse with which most of us are familiar. Jesus says, But seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be given to you as well. This is the wonderful words of life for us God's people. Thanks be to God. So in, in three success, successive sessions or, of the, or sections of the Sermon on the Mount, it seems to me that Jesus' focus centers around this theme. Think the best. Or we could maybe phrase it um, Believe for the best. Thinking about the best or believing for the best. So let's keep that in mind as we work through this morning. So beginning with the verses, the first section, verses 25 through 34, um, we realize that as we are living, as our text states, by daily, quote, seeking first God's kingdom, uh, God's rule, God's reign in our own lives, then we will think the best, we'll believe for the best about the future and what's going to happen in the future. But it's so easy, isn't it, to do just the opposite of that, to think the worst about the future and to do what? To worry about the future. Verse 25, Jesus says so plainly, do not worry about your life. And he uses the emphatic in the Greek language, which means stop it. Just stop it and never do it again. Think the best, in other words. Think the best about what will happen in the future. So what's Jesus not saying? Jesus is not saying give no forethought to your life. Because planning for tomorrow is time well spent. But seeking first the kingdom of God, the rule of God, the reign of God in our lives is time best spent. So worrying about tomorrow is time wasted 
today. Worrying about tomorrow is time wasted today. Could Jesus have been any clearer about the waste of worry when he poses this question? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? That's verse 27. So can we not add one measly hour to our lives by worrying? Nope, we can't do it. So Jesus is leading us away from something. And that something is this. It's, it's, it's the worried fear that, that steals the enjoyment out of life. What, what worried fear does is this. Uh, worried fear leads us um, to place fear and um, just paralyzed inaction in place of faith and practical action. Let me say that again because this is important. Worried fear leads us to place fear and paralyzed inaction in place of faith and practical action. So we ask ourselves the question, would we say that our lives are characterized more by fear and paralyzed inaction or by faith and practical action? You know, we, we counteract worry about the future by doing what we can in the present and by trusting God where we can't. Think about it a minute. If, if, if we're busy each day trusting in God's promises and waiting on God's timing in our lives for whatever we may be dealing with, we aren't focusing on worry. Here's our text from another translation. It gives a little bit different nuance, but it means the same thing. So Jesus speaks again in verse 33. But more than anything else, put God's work first and do what he wants. And then the other things will be yours as well. So born out of Jesus' words about worry um, is a legend that reminds us, uh, or at least many of us, about ourselves. It's about a grandfather clock, and it goes something like this. As it sat there, stood there on the floor, ticking away as any good clock would do, tick tock, tick tock, it began to think about how many times it had to tick. You know, I think, you know, two ticks per second. Well, that means 120 ticks every minute. And that's 7,200 ticks every hour. That's 172,800 each day. That's 1,209,600 per week. That's around 63 million times a year, meaning over a 10-year period, that's 630 million times. And so right then and there, the clock started to just panic and nearly had a nervous breakdown. Can we identify with the clock in any way? When we're thinking about what we have to do, a few ticks down the line. Well, so the clock went to see a, a therapist. And so the therapist said, well, clock, what's your trouble? How can I help you? And the clock said, oh, doc, I have to tick so much. Two times a second, 120 times a minute, 7,200 times an hour. And right there, the therapist cut the clock off and said, hold on just a minute. How many times do you have to tick at a time? The clock said, well, I have to just tick one tick at a time. Well, here's my advice, he said. Don't. When you get home, don't even think about the next tick until it's time for that tick. Just one tick at a time. You can do that. I know you can do that. And that clock ticked one tick at a time for the next 100 years. And everyone just loved to hear that old grandfather clock tick. Friends, we trust God one 
tick at a time, or at least we're called to trust God one tick at a time and trust that God will provide for us the resources that we need for the next tick when it's time for that tick to occur. And if we're, as Jesus says in our text today, quote, seeking first the kingdom, the rule, the reign of God in our lives, then we'll find ourselves thinking the best. We'll find ourselves believing for the best about the future and about what will happen in the future, in the ticks that lie ahead. Then we go into chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, and we find that, that, quote, as Jesus would say, seeking first the kingdom of God, the rule of God, the reign of God in our lives also leads us to think the best or to believe for the best about others. Because Jesus says in Verse 1 of chapter 7, do not judge. And he gives us an example of who not to be like by introducing us to someone I've always liked to call Old Law Guy. He talked about Old Law Guy. Old Old Law Guy is always busy pointing out specifically in someone else's eye that speck, that tiny little speck of sawdust in someone else's eye, while he's got this huge log protruding out of his own eye. Now, Jesus is using using two things here to make a point. He's using hyperbole, right? A log projected out of someone's eye, and also humor, because that's a, picture that as a a, a cartoon. Um, So he's using both. Do not judge, Jesus teaches. Isn't he urging us to think the best, to believe the best about other people and, and let God be the judge of other people. Because only God has an unobstructed view of each individual's life. There's no way that we can know everyone's entire story. Only God has that completely unobstructed view of their life. Read about a man who uh, He was having a tough time communicating with his wife, and he decided she was hard of hearing. He even had said to a friend, you know, she couldn't hear a cannon go off in the room. And so he decided one day he was going to give her uh, a hearing test without her knowing about it. Her back was to him. She was sitting across the other side of the room. And he, he said, he whispered from the other side of the room, can you hear me? No answer. Her back still to him. He stepped a little closer. He asked again, can you hear me now? No response. He stepped closer, whispered, okay, now can you hear me? Still no answer. So he got right behind her, just maybe a foot behind her head. He said, okay, now can you hear me? And she in Uh, aggravation turned around and said yes for the fourth time I can hear you (laughs) his wife might have had a speck in her ear but this guy had a log protruding out of his ear right he's the one who really couldn't hear if we're again as Jesus says in our text quote seeking first the kingdom the rule the reign of God in our own lives, then we'll be very aware of our own flaws. We'll we'll be thinking about our own flaws and shortcomings and our sins, and we'll find ourselves thinking the best, believing for the best about other people and letting God be their judge. And then we move on to verse 7 with Jesus. If we're seeking first the kingdom, the rule, the reign of God in our lives, then we'll also be thinking the best and believing the best about prayer and how God will ultimately respond to our prayers. You know, prayer is the key that that opens the door to God's blessings. And, And here Jesus teaches, ask, seek, knock. Ask for what you need. He says, 
Ask, seek, knock. And it's so important for us to know that Jesus uses the present tense for these verbs, indicating what? That we're to keep on asking and keep on seeking and keep on knocking. In the present tense, knocking, seeking, asking through what? Through prayer. Through prayer. Then he gives us a promise in the next verse, verse 8. He says, For everyone who asks receives, and for everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. So as we knock with our needs in prayer, we trust that God will satisfy our needs through prayer. And then Jesus follows with an illustration, an illustration to give us further reassurance. And here's what he says. It's a good, it's a very spot on uh, illustration as Jesus always does. He says, if your child asks for bread, do you trick him with sawdust? If he asks for fish, do you scare him with a live snake on his plate? You're at least decent to your own children. So don't, don't you think that the God who conceived you in love will be even better? Friends, if we humans can be kind, imagine how kind God can be. And so if we're seeking first that kingdom, that rule, that reign of God in our own lives, then we're going to find ourselves thinking the best, believing for the best about how God will ultimately respond to our prayers. And then we go forward, verse 12, this is sort of a pinnacle, sort of a pinnacle at this point, and as, as, we, as we wrap down, um, if we're, again, seeking first the kingdom, the rule, the reign of God in our own lives, then we will also find ourselves thinking the best, believing for the best about what we can do for others, about what we can do for others. And here is where Jesus gives us what we call the golden rule, the golden rule. Have you ever heard of that? being referred to as the Everest of ethics, the golden rule, the Mount Everest of ethics. Here it is. Jesus says, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. Let me ask a question. Are you aware that the golden rule is not unique with Jesus? Except in one very unique way. You know, it's found in, in, in many forms in highly diverse settings. But there's one significant difference. Elsewhere, we find the golden rule stated in the negative. Basically saying, don't do to others what you don't want done to you. Jesus is the one who states it positively. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. Thinking the best about what we can do for others, friends, means what? It means simply that, that we take the initiative ourselves in doing the exact same thing for someone else that we would want that person to do to us. We take the initiative in doing that. Always putting ourselves in the shoes of the other person and always asking the question of ourselves, how would I like to be treated in this situation? How would I like to be treated in this situation? If we live consistently by the golden rule, Jesus tells us that all else falls into place from that point. Referring to the golden rule, here are his words. For this sums up the law and the prophets, the Old Testament law and the teachings of the prophets. The golden rule sums it all up. So in essence, what's he saying? In essence, Jesus is saying, 
Therefore, in light of all that I've taught about the Old Testament law and the Old Testament prophets, follow the golden rule. So, if we consistently follow the golden rule, where do we find ourselves again? We find ourselves living on the Everest of ethics and thinking the best, believing for the best about what we can do for others. And so as we're, as we're pulling into the dock at this point, let's just quickly reflect. Wouldn't it be a tremendous blessing in life to live our lives thinking the best, believing for the best about the future and what will happen in the future? Wouldn't it be a tremendous blessing to live our lives thinking the best, believing for the best about others? Wouldn't it be a tremendous blessing to live our lives thinking the best, believing for the best about prayer and how God will ultimately respond to our prayers and wouldn't it be a tremendous blessing to be able to live our lives thinking the best believing for the best about what we can do for others it'd be a tremendous blessing seeking first the kingdom the rule the reign of God in our own lives is time best spent. And I absolutely am convinced that the Lord would agree 100%. As we conclude our time of worship together again this week and we face another week ahead of us, let's go forth being convinced that Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will send the comforter, the counselor to be with you forever to guide us and direct us. And so our prayer is that the Holy Spirit would um, always be a known presence in our lives to guide us and direct us in following Christ our Lord. And may the blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each of us today and always. Amen.